Hello everyone, I'm uh, Kevin Nesbitt, I'm a security engineer on Gravity, our Kubernetes distribution. And tonight I'm going to talk about uh, bringing WireGuard and Kubernetes together. Um, it'll be fairly uh, straightforward, like I'll go through the base technologies because not everyone uh, is necessarily exposed to it, um, and go from there. So it's an open source project, you can download it, run with it, play with it. Um, let us know how broken it is, stuff like that. So to get started with knowing kind of the basics, um, who here has heard of WireGuard? So actually a pretty good portion of the room, which is good. Uh, who, you know, is fairly comfortable that they really know what WireGuard is or is doing? Just a few people. Okay, perfect. So this is the ads or the high-level items that are basically taken straight off the WireGuard website. It's a fast, modern, secure VPN tunnel. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. We know VPNs. I think most of us have worked with them. But what does being fast, modern, and secure work? Well, what it really comes down to is picking encryption mechanisms that can be run inside CPU or offloaded quickly. Modern is the security industry has learned a lot over the past 10 years, 20 years, and things have really changed. And a big piece of that is this simplicity and easy to use. Um, if how many people have looked through and gone, should I be picking a 256-bit RSA key or a 2,000-bit RSA key, right? No one can make the right choices. So the people behind the protocol go, there's not even going to be a choice anymore. We're going to pick the standard that everyone should use. Cryptographically sound. This is really related. What that comes down to is they're using the modern best standards for protocols that are known. These are the same protocols you use in TLS and stuff like that, but taken to a much more minimal attack surface, which is the next point. Attack surface is how wide of an API or how wide of a net do you produce. And the larger you are, the more likely there's a bug that can be exploited on one side or the other. Think of something like TLS that has protocol negotiation. If anything you can negotiate is vulnerable, then, sorry, then the entire protocol is vulnerable. WireGuard goes, hey, we're not even going to do protocol negotiation. When you configure it, that is the protocol. There's no cipher selection, no pick weak defaults, no bits that can be flipped in transit that produce a different result. High performance is just about the choices made. And because you combine this together and make a minimal surface area system, it's well-defined. Uh, university researchers have gone through and done TLA plus against the protocol to look for vulnerabilities and stuff like that because it's not something that's so rich and complicated that you can't even write tests for or understand. So now that we know a little bit of WireGuard, let's talk about CNI. CNI is sort of an outshoot of history where I think today most people agree Kubernetes is kind of one. But at a certain point, there's multiple orchestrators that were all built around Docker networking, um, and specifically container networking, and all of them needed sort of the same capabilities. Kubernetes doesn't actually tell you how to network things. It tells you that you have to have certain network capabilities, but you still need a translation into how your local network or environment works. You know, Google Cloud has their own APIs to control networking, so they need a translation layer between Kubernetes and the Google Cloud APIs to set up networking. Your on-prem world, you know, it's hit and miss on what capabilities you might have. So this is where you get all these different plugins. For the Kubernetes folks, you know, Flannel, Weave, et cetera, sort of the, the common names. Um, but they're all built off of a generic plugin framework that you apply to a Kubernetes cluster. The last kind of base technology I want to go into is overlay networking, because a lot of us might not really be aware of what happens. So if we have a three-node cluster like we're showing here, 
And this is sort of you boot up VMs on the cloud or even plug in computers at home. You have a flat network with an IP space and all of the hosts can talk to each other. They're all connected to each other on that network. But that network might not offer us all the capabilities we want, so we want to build an overlay network that is a fake network. It doesn't exist in a real way from a physical perspective, but it's a virtual network that's built on top of the existing network. And when we want to communicate through this overlay network, what we want to actually do is have the overlay network produce packets on the overlay interface, but we want something to happen when it's passed to the physical interface that encapsulates that packet or extends it in some way, that it can then exist in step two over the physical network, and the physical network will move it between machines, and then at step three, the reverse happens. Node two receives the packet and re reverses the process of the encapsulation or whatever is done to that packet to extend it. So now that we've got kind of the basics out of the way, what we're seeing happen with Gravity, our Kubernetes distribution, is we saw a request come up a few times, which is something along the lines of, a customer just installed Gravity on our network, and they ran TCP dump, and they saw unencrypted traffic, and therefore it's insecure. Uh, it might be DNS packets, it might be uh, metrics endpoints, um, stuff like that, uh, but that's insecure. We don't trust our own network, so we want to have a solution for that. That's not something we have to rebuild or extend our product. We just want it to kind of magically work behind the scenes, and we all know how good magic is, right? So. Um, Basically, you're down to, we do not trust the network for whatever reasons, good or bad. And for us, the challenge is not just, because there are encrypted solutions out there, but how do we keep it simple? Because a lot of the clusters we run are clusters we don't even have access to, right? Some of our customers' customers will not even send us screenshots of their systems because that's a, a security threat. So we need a system that is close to existing networking that is more likely to work on an ongoing basis than it is to cause us problems and glitches and trying to read BPF programs from the kernel to figure out why the TLS connection didn't activate when it was supposed to. So this is where we came up with Wormhole. So Wormhole is a CNI plugin like we discussed, specifically for Kubernetes. We don't support any of the other distributions because we're a Kubernetes company, to be honest. And what it does is it uses WireGuard to build a transparent encryption of all traffic that crosses between hosts. So that's all of your internal traffic to the cluster that gets scheduled in pods. As they talk to each other, it'll go across an encrypted network layer. The upper layer of securities can still completely exist, but you get an additional layer of protection. And one of the benefits of this is it's multi-protocol. So this is probably a good week to have this talk because Istio just this week is um, getting some flack because they don't support the H2 upgrade header correctly. Because for upper layer protocol level things, they have to actually implement the protocols themselves in order to intercept them. So it's traffic like DNS, HTTP2, but maybe you're doing some exotic things. You want to run a SIP controller, you want to run RTP traffic, video streaming. A lot of these layered tr uh, transport connections don't work, where with WireGuard, when we go layer before and do the transport connection, as long as you're speaking IP, you at least have a layer of encryption. And internally, we follow a controller architecture and run control loops to keep everything in sync. So as you add nodes to the cluster, everything reconfigures itself. Cluster gets deleted, it gets reconfigured as well. So if we go back to our example and build our overlay network of what's happening, we rename our interfaces to be wormhole wireguard interfaces. And we're using our VPN technology now to set up the encrypted tunnels for our overlay network. The next piece we need to add is routing. 
So the routing table inside your Linux kernel with WireGuard will look something like this. Your default route will go straight to the Ethernet interface. The overlay network route will go towards the WireGuard interface and we're gonna create a bridge inside um, the node. Uh, for those of you who are not really deep into networking, what a bridge is, is think of it sort of like your home router you get from Verizon or your, your carrier. And you have four ports on the back of it. And you plug in computers, the computers can talk to each other. The mechanism that allows packets to move between ports in Ethernet networking is called a bridge. Now the router is gonna do some extra stuff, but that's the base concept. What we're gonna do is we're gonna move that into the node, but it's a virtual concept because it's not physical hardware, and we're going to create virtual Ethernet cables to support this. So Kubernetes works on a pod concept where you create pods within the node and you assign them IP addresses. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a virtual cable that connects to our bridge that allows the connectivity to occur. And if we try and follow a flow, if I want to send a packet from pod one to pod three, the packet originates on ethernet zero inside the pod's network namespace. It goes across this virtual ethernet cable we created to the bridge. The packet isn't destined within the bridge, so the routing layer picks it up, sends it to our WireGuard interface to be encrypted and routed. The encryption headers are added, so that's where the security comes into play and goes across the Ethernet network, and the reverse happens on node two to deliver the packet. So, now that we know sort of how it works and what's happening, usually when we pick security products, it's kind of important to make considerations on what they do and don't do. Um, and for encrypted things, um, to me, sort of, a couple big items come up. First one is how do you do key exchange and handling? So yourself, if you're going to configure WireGuard, you need to move keys around in order to set up the encrypted connections. Um, we take care of that behind the scenes by using the Kubernetes API, um, and we make all of the keys in the system ephemeral. So we're not introducing new key handling requirements where someone has to think about if I lose a backup on my system, what happened? Uh, the inevitable, it's happened to me, where someone has uh, copied the secrets to their laptop and they left the laptop in their car without um, any disk encryption. How do you recover from that environment? And that's one of the things that is often overlooked in, in uh, product security. So when your key is compromised, and assume you will lose your secrets at some point, how do you rotate those secrets? So we focused a lot on that with Wormhole and we kind of removed that consideration just in the sense that as soon as you restart a process, it will regenerate all keys, invalidate all old keys automatically, and therefore all you have to do is restart a process and your keys are reset. Nothing more complicated than that. The last point is protocol handling and identity. The nice thing about upper layer protocols, specifically TLS, is you can embed identity in them. So when you create tiers inside your Kubernetes architecture, like a web tier talking to a database, with a lot of the TLS plugins you can do is you can embed identity that says this connection is coming from a web tier, and then you can put policy on the endpoint that says as a web tier node, you can only do certain things. You can only read an account database and not all your other databases. In our case, because we're going down a layer as a simpler tool, we don't do anything with identity. So that still has to happen somewhere else inside your applications and things like that. But for depending on what the application is, that might not be important or network policy is enough to create isolations. So to show really quickly the key handling is say the controller on node one restarts, it's gonna publish its public key and a shared secret. Um, these are WireGuard keys. The public key is the same public key you get anywhere else. The shared secret, excuse me, 
is just for um, sort of a post-quantum protection. It's not really needed, but because we have a key handling mechanism, we uh, deliver it anyways. All the other nodes will be watching that API, and they will pull down those secrets as they're published. And that's because we're leveraging the API connection that already exa exists with Kubelet, we don't create new secret handling requirements. So all I've done is I've created a kubeadm-based cluster, and I've gone as far through the installation as the nodes are booted, but they're all not ready because networking isn't available yet. So similar to if you're playing Flannel or any other plugin, we're just going to apply a YAML file from GitHub. And that YAML file will go through, it's going to create a namespace for our controllers, set up pod security policies and service counts, all those kind of background things, and create a daemon set, which is all of our controllers. The daemon set mounts the service account, which allows the API access for things to exist. Uh, what I'm also going to do is create some work on this cluster just so everything gets created because without pods and stuff being scheduled, uh, not all of the CNI will initialize. So let's look at node 2, which is one of the workers. And we'll start by looking at WireGuard. So WG is the WireGuard CLI, and we can see here that we have peers configured for all the other peers in our cluster, which IP address they currently have, allowed IPs, etc. So that's the encrypted layer existing. And I'll put that at the top. We also set up our routing table. So you can see towards our WG0 interface, we have the route for our overlay network. Um, the bridge interface is the local pods, uh, et cetera. Um, let's see here, PRCTL show. And finally, our bridge, we have it created here, and we can see the virtual cables that exist in that bridge. So if we follow startup real quick um, to debug what happened, uh, it's interacting with any other Kubernetes software you're, you're used to. We have a controller. When it starts up, it tries to figure out what IP address ranges have been assigned to the cluster, things like that. Builds a configuration for itself. What's the current node name, the overlay network, the interfaces to use, stuff like that. And then it goes into control loops that start setting up IP table rules in order to uh, do NAT and things like that, similar that you get from any other controller. And after the IP table routes are created, we start setting up WireGuard and stuff like that with our keys. At this point, we're up and running. We have networking between hosts. And, well, sorry, we don't have networking between hosts. We start adding our peers, and then we're up and running. And now we're just into control loop. So, like any security system, should I use it? The answer is, let's say no, don't use it. Um, like any technical choice, it applies to what you need. And we apply to a niche where you don't trust the network and you want to encrypt that network layer and you don't have the upper layers that you can rely on or you want to layer security. So only if it makes sense, uh, you know, take a close look at it. Um, also, you know, it's alpha, it's not super battle tested, so use at your own risk and then let us know what doesn't work. Uh, it's open source, so you can take it, pull it, run it. And if you want to contact us, here's the uh, general contact information. Thank you.